All righty. So, hello again, Trey. Yeah, how's it going? <laughs> it's going all right, you? Very good. <laughs> all right, well, I asked you off camera a bit about yourself, but do you mind saying a bit more of who you are, what your, what your deal is around here? Who I am, what, what my deal is. Um, Loosely speaking. Yeah. Uh, in the grant, in like, as as in right now or just in my life like like uh let's start with right now oh right now i'm uh spending most of my time arranging is kind of is mostly what i'm doing mm -hmm. um um you know i helped build the studio and i'm a part of space bomb and but i'm less there was a time when i was here every day mm -hmm. uh, th these days i'm not so much so i'm doing more arranging and so I'll be here when I'm recording and working on stuff like that. Um, and I also have a, a sample library company that I own. So <laughs> that I, that's sort of my nerdy side project that I, I've had for years, but during COVID, I kind of like started getting into it again. Cause yeah, all, believe like, me, I'm all for nerdy side yeah, projects. Yeah, <laughs> Cause you know, every record label basically stopped, stopped the budget on everything. So no one was recording for a while. So. So anyway, so I kind of put some life back into that during COVID. So I spent some time on that. And so it's mostly that and arranging. Well, mostly arranging and then that. Um, that's kind of my day-to-day -day life these days. Sounds like a good MO. Tell yeah. me about arranging. So, yeah. I mean, at this point, I've been doing it for, let's see, it's 2022. So over 10 years. Wow. Um, the first record I did was Matthew E. White's first record mm -hmm. um, when he kind of came up with the idea to start Space Bomb and he wanted to do these kind of arrangement heavy records. And I had done some strings, like writing for strings and stuff when we were in college together. And we had done a few like weird side project things, like some orchestra stuff. And so that was the first record I did. And then kind of from there, uh, you know, you, one record leads to the next. And I didn't really ever intend... I mean, I was always interested in arranging, and I um, studied it quite a bit in school, and um, I've always been interested in it, but I never kind of thought I would be an arranger. So one record to the next, and then someone hears the thing you do, and then you, then you get to ask them to do it again. So, so I've been doing that now for, yeah, 10 years, and... Um, it's great. I love it. And it's kind of like, you know, one of those things you don't plan for it, but it ends up being something that's quite fulfilling. And, um, you know, for, for many years there, I was touring a bunch too. So, but I don't really do that anymore at this point. I think I'm too old for that. <laughs> Stationary. Just, yeah. I got kids now. So it's like, you know, thing, arranging, I can just be at home, you know, um, for the most part. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so it's mostly, I would say 85% of it's string stuff, but then there's like just like orchestra, full orchestra stuff and some horn arranging and things like that. So, and I do, I'll do a little producing. Uh, you know, I did a record with this uh, singer, Nad Nadia Reed, a couple mm -hmm. years ago. It's a really cool record that I did the arranging, but I also like produced it too. So, arranging in the in the grander sense of the word <laughs> telling everyone what to play the wide definition yeah, yeah telling the drummer what to play also um so yeah i mean that's that's kind of my day-to-day -day and um yeah and like recording so most of my time in the studio these days is tracking arrangements that i've been writing and um yeah that's pretty much that. That sounds like a good day to day to me. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. Do you sure. would it be safe to say that this kind of comes from passion, that drive that you kind of feel to do this stuff? Because you said you love it. Yeah, but yeah, but no. I mean, yes, I love it because I'm <laughs> I love music. Of course, and yeah. I'm good at it. It's it's fun to be good at things. But um, I mean, it's fun to do the thing you're good at. Yes, right? yes. Um. No, I mean, ultimately, when I started, yeah, it was there was no money, there was no job. Mm -hmm. um, so when me and Matt and the other guys in Space Bomb and the other people around made that first record, the first Space Bomb record, 
it was, it was, I, mean, I want to say it's not about passion. Of course, every, uh, making music good has to have passion. But I mean, it's not, it's not like, uh, sorry, scam, likely. You should probably get that. Mr. Mr. Likely. <laughs> um, it's not as though I would be, you know, doing it every day if it didn't pay anything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That like makes someone sense. who's just an artist and they make some kind of performance art no matter what that's going on in their life um so but at the beginning there, it, it you know it was that and but it's it's a passion to to create a an environment for yourself where the thing you want to do is the thing you can get paid to do and live your life doing so in that regard yeah it's pa it is passion but it isn't it is a job do you know what i mean it is yeah, work yeah. <laughs> and it is um it is a thing that you don't always love what you're doing, you know, hopefully most of the time you do. And pretty much every time I get in the room with musicians and recording the thing, kind of no matter what the record is, um, I should say 95% of the time I love the music I'm making. But I had an experience fairly recently that was not like that. <laughs> but still, when you get in the room with the musicians and you're recording it, that's, that's, that's the best. That's the payoff at the end of at the end of every project. So... Um, so yes, there's passion. You want to inject passion into the music. You want to be passionate about the thing you're doing, but it isn't purely for the, for the passion. Like I don't do it for that. Sure. Sure. So it's not necessarily a guarantee that, oh, I have passion in everything, but you're able to find passion if it's something you're genuinely interested in. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, you have to, when you're working on music, especially music that's not yours, like, mm -hmm. When I make, like, I put out a record of my, my own music a few years ago, and it's like, that was for the passion. Of it. That was just, or not passion. I wouldn't use that word. You use the word, so I keep saying <laughs> sorry, it. Sorry, sorry. No, it's fine. It's, it's good. Uh, but it's, you know, I did that no matter what. There was, there was no uh, um, economy around yeah. it. It was yeah, purely yeah, yeah. for the sake of making music, right? Music for its own sake. Um but when you're when you're working on music that's other people's music, which m most of the time is what I do, I'm someone asks me to decorate a, a small corner of their art, you know, and so you have to find something in it that you can be passionate about, um, and that you can have something to contribute. And the only way you can have something to contribute is if you give a shit and like. Sorry, I probably shouldn't curse on this. I, you're talking to a bunch of college students. <laughs> okay. Like, okay. I'm sure they've heard worse. Okay, I'm just yeah, I'm <laughs> not going to be broadcast on uh, AM radio. You think um, I, you think I want to look like this being broadcast? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think you know you have to you have to find that in your work in order for it to be any good. Uh, I mean, in general, and it can be it can be small things. You know, like this little moment here is the thing that. I think it's, it's so great. It makes it for you. Yeah, and so then, uh, then it's all worth it, you know. I no, I think that's a good way to put it. Didn't mean to put any concepts in your mouth, of course. No, no, no. <laughs> it's just funny when you say the word passion, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna agree with you. Mm -hmm. and find a way to agree with that. I just don't think I would use that word. It's more about like the, like the love of the craft, of arranging, and the love of the ability to find a moment in someone's music that you can like elevate their thing and like try to understand where someone else is coming from like it's you don't understand their music as well as they do right sure. so they so you're hoping you can just get some understanding and then say oh okay i understand that and then let me let me help that one thing so that's kind of the thing i'm striving for all the time Okay, I, I think that's a good way to put it. I'm going to pivot slightly. Please. So, you've been doing this for over 10 years, mm -hmm. you said. Has your perception of music as a concept changed from before you were composing and arranging to where you sit now? So this is a broad, broad question. So when you say concept of music, what do you mean? Perhaps the way that music functions in your mm -hmm. life. Oh, 
Mm, no, I, I don't think so. No, I think my relationship with music is more or less the same as it was when I was a kid. Okay. I think you like the things you like. <laughs> you you try to. I've always been this way. I try to find out the things that I really like. I try to find out why I like them, mm-hmm. and I try to replicate scenarios in which I'm making music that I like. <laughs> and I've been doing that since I was a kid. You know, you make you start your first band, or you get like a four track, and and start making music. So I think that's basically the same. I mean, obviously, I'm much better at it and yeah, I understand yeah. it on a much deeper level about all kinds of things about music but no my I don't have no it hasn't changed my concept of music I mean I think what I obviously what I like and what I listen to and what kind of what I can appreciate and the, the moments that I can enjoy about music are much wider than when I was younger and even 10 years ago even when I was in college you know so, I think I just like more things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, no, basically it's the same relationship, I would say. What was that starting band you mentioned that you found out you loved and you wanted to know why you loved it? Oh, I mean, oh, so many things. I mean, everything. <laughs> I don't know. Like, really? Like, Hendrix. I don't know. Mm. Like, you're, you're a kid, but I play guitar. That's why I grew up playing. Very nice. So, it's like, why is this so good? Why do I like this so much? <laughs> but everything. I mean... I could name an endless number of things I could name, but like, that's the thing that stuck out when I was a kid, you know, for whatever reason, it's like, why is this works? Why is this cool? So some kind of connection that you wanted to explore. Not a connection. It's like, there are things inherent in every piece of music or every musical statement. There are things about it that exist like, in nature do you know what i mean mm-hmm. like the, the 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 way the sound works that i think that it's not about like a relationship with i mean i have a relationship with all this music <laughs> because you have a history with things and you have personal relationships but i mean more about that inspiring thing that is just purely like whoa i like the way that sounds what is going on mm-hmm. that basically that is the same and that is the whole thing to this day and like when i'm arranging something for somebody it's like you hear a sound you're like "Ooh, that's a cool sound like how do i manipulate that or make that work with this new thing that, okay okay that makes sense thank you for uh putting it in a way that made more sense for me. yeah <laughs> that's why i try yeah you you did good effort okay, for good, sure yeah let's see uh so uh you have worked with lots of pretty decently well-known artist matthew white as you mm-hmm. mentioned has had some success you have uh elado negro natalie press mm-hmm. uh have you ever felt like a little bit of pride when you saw that they did pretty successfully yeah for sure yeah i mean i think you know uh it's always tempered with you know you're essentially doing you know, you're doing a job, you're doing a, a, you're fulfilling a, a function in, whether it's a record or an artist's whole career or whatever it is. And so you have pride in the fact, you should always have, I mean, I would hope that when you're doing things that you feel like you're doing a good job, you have pride about the thing you're doing. I wouldn't say I feel pride in that because something does well, it makes me feel better about what I did. I don't think that's true. I don't feel that. But, you know, for some of those, like Natalie, you know, I toured with her for a spell after we did uh, the first record. Um, And I did the same thing with Foxygen. Like I made a record with them and I toured with them. And so there's a kind of a different world where you're, on stage with someone where you're you're kind of experience them in a different scenario than the reason that you're there right i was there with foxygen because i wrote arrangements for the record and then they needed an mv to go out on tour and put a band together so i did that as a secondary job so then i'm on stage and they're getting all these you know screaming fans <laughs> big massive 
RDSs. So you have, that's kind of like, you get to see it from another angle. So that's cool. But um, I don't know, I kind of lost the thread there. <laughs> well, uh, tell me about touring. Touring, yeah. I mean, I liked, I, I you know, I like it. I, you know, I, I like a lot of things about it. Um, I think at this point, like, I'm just kind of done with it. But, um, you know, I got to see a lot of the world and, you know, Europe and pretty much all the U.S. and South America. Um, many times. To name a few. Many times <laughs> over. Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel very uh, fortunate. You know, it was... It was um, yeah, those are places that I would probably have not, you know, I definitely would not have gone and get to see, you know, when you're, when you're on tour, though, it's not, it's not, it's work, like, it is really work. I know people, it seems glamorous, and in a way it is, because you get to go to these places, but you don't really get to, you know, you're talking with, like, friends that travel for, they went to Italy for their honeymoon, or they did whatever, and, like, Oh yeah, I went there, but I didn't see any of the things that you just mentioned because I <laughs> had to work. I went to a sound check and then I played the gig and then we got on the bus and we drove to the next place. So I didn't do any of those things. Yeah, yeah. So on the one hand, I you know, I would never pretend like it wasn't an incredible I was very fortunate to do it. Um but on the other hand it is like it's work and it's you know, it's hard. It can be really quite hard actually, and very tiring and taxing. So, um, I think for me, it's, I'm just kind of done with it. But, um, I mean, there are places I would have liked to go on. You know, I never got to go to Japan, never got to go to Australia. So, uh, there's still time for leisure trips. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, we could go there for, for a vacation. But, um, but so, yeah, for that reason, it's definitely cool and worth doing. And some people obviously do their, do it their whole life and they love it. Sure. Yeah. I think, you know, when you're, get out of school 25 to now ish yeah. 39 you know it's like the time is when you're when you're in music you often have to do many things you mm -hmm. know and you end up kind of going where the energy is right where is their energy at this moment and music is very seasonal the music industry is very seasonal i don't mean like summer fall winter I mean, yeah just like there's a season for a certain kind of thing and you'll feel it like okay like right now, I'm just like arranging all the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a time where I was touring all the time. Um, and you kind of just like, I mean, you don't have to, but for me, it's like I find that I was just like, kind of go where the energy was. I was like, okay, well, this is going to be a thing I'm doing for now. Um, and there was, there's been other seasons where I did different things. You know, I did like wrote music for commercials and wrote music for. <laughs> <laughs> lowest common denominator cable tv shows like <laughs> tlc and bravo and so, you know i did that for a season and that was cool and i learned some things mm -hmm. so um but for me touring was that it was like there was a season where that was a thing and and that's what i did and i liked it um so i probably won't do it again <laughs> yeah. it, you've had your share of it yeah I do like one offs. Like in November, I have to. I'm going to Atlanta to do an MD for a show um, for Faye Webster, like a big kind of orchestra thing. Mm -hmm. So I like doing that. I like just like flying out and like doing a few days and then coming out. That's <laughs> that's kind of my quick business. Yeah, that's ventures. my vibe at this time. Yeah. Cool. Well, this might be opening a can of worms, but tell me about arranging. Tell you about what? Your arrangements. Oh, about them. Um, in what, in what respect? I mean, it's such a large, it's such a large <laughs> I, question. I knew I was starting something big. <laughs> that is a can of worms. Yeah. I suppose your process of arranging. Ah, process. Yeah. Um, process for me usually is, um, someone reaches out. Usually the basics are they want strings. That's sort of. The, the extent to which they've thought about it that seems so, to be your go-to yeah yeah but i when i say that i mean that they don't have a clear picture of what they want mm -hmm. they just oh this song is pretty i think it should have strings producer guys that... like, we should have strings okay um and so then i'm called and brought in to put string 
and uh and so it's a fairly open-ended uh often it's an open-ended situation sometimes uh, um people have specific ideas they want they hear this melody or oh i played this part on guitar in the bridge but i want it to be strings most of the time it's not that though but occasionally it is and so yeah and so you're trying to um essentially distill the song down into what you think the important bits are and like try to find a place for whatever the instruments they want to live you know and so and it can be very easy and it can be very difficult you know sometimes people send you tracks that have tons of stuff they've been overdubbing since their you know the last olympics yeah and, uh, <laughs> And there's no room for anything. And you're like, well, what do I do here? Sometimes it's like acoustic guitar and a vocal, and you're like, I can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of the job is really almost like the psychology of like talking to the artist and trying to get them to give you a clue about what, what it is they want, what do they want the arrangement to do, what do they want the arrangement to how does it elevate the music you know and and often especially in the world i travel in which is like indie rock world mostly mm -hmm. you know these people uh artists are money I, most of them i work with are amazing and yeah. but they don't speak music talk they don't speak notes notation and, and whatnot and, and yeah string articulations and stuff so and that's actually better. It's actually worse when they try to talk that because they usually don't quite understand it totally. Even if they're, you know, they they know a lot about music or they went to music school, but they don't understand it as well as I do, obviously. So they're trying to use words they don't know. But so you know, they're like, "Oh, I want it to feel like sad here," and the, they'll tell you about, "Oh, this lyric means this, like something." That... So you're trying to kind of glean what it is they want and like how does that relate to actual dots on paper i see okay um, and so the actual act of writing the thing and finding counter melodies and finding voicing the, the harmony and and all that stuff that's like that's the easy part that's just like yeah I, and but the hard part is trying to find what it is they want because you don't want to be going back and forth too much and spending ages and mm -hmm. um you know recording strings uh, orchestra stuff is expensive because it takes lots of people mm -hmm. i kind of specifically don't do like the overdub a bunch of violin players thing like there's a world in which people do that and that's cool but like i don't do that i sure. don't say no to that um so like i gotta get at least 10 13 15 people in the room so it gets expensive so my point being is that you want people to feel like they're spending a lot of money you want them to feel like <laughs> you understand them and that the and then you get it and then what you're going to do is going to add a lot because especially in this day and age people are used to overdubbing all the time over and over and then they go oh i don't like it i'll let me try it again but it's like no i called the people they're here we're done like you have to pay for it now yep like, yeah that's how it works we don't we don't try it again there is no let's try it again so that is you have to be very you have to handle it with kid gloves you know and make sure people mm -hmm. feel like you're respecting their music and that you understand their music you know as best you can and that you know so that's kind of the that's the hard part um and I mean, I'm good. I, I'm good at it at this point, but it is that is always the the trick, and you know, and different artists are different ways. You know, some people you're dealing with the producer only, and you never talk to the artist. Some people you're there is no producer, and you're trying to, you know, hold their hand through the process and be like, it's all gonna be okay. You know, <laughs> like people, like I say, because of the people's relationship with sitting at their laptop, it's like it's hard for a lot of people to give away the keys for this little moment it's like you know yeah. like i have to like write it down and we have to do it and it's not like you can't just like you're not gonna be able to change it later you know it's just not possible so anyway so that's kind of a big part of the process and like i say sometimes it's amazing and easy and beautiful um 
I had a situation recently that was the exact opposite. I could never have imagined a situation so gnarly. <laughs> it was very, very, very rare. Almost always it's just a very magical experience and people mm -hmm. walk away over the moon, you know? Yeah. So, Do you have any recent experiences that would be good to talk about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, well, this Faye Webster record that came out in the spring, we did that a year ago here in November. Mm -hmm. um, that was a cool, that was really cool because she and her producer Drew just wanted, it's just her and orchestra. That was the idea, vocals and orchestra. And this is an idea that had been floating for years. A lot of records, especially when people are doing big arrangements where there's, they need to, their label has to say yes and hand over a large sum of money to do it um they take forever so this was one i never thought was going to actually happen there's you know there's all kinds of things people mm -hmm. have an idea oh i want to do an orchestra doing a record with an orchestra is like the ubiquitous like the thing i want to do <laughs> it's like, so there's lots of emails like that that go nowhere and like you, you end up talking to people for months and then it just sits there but so all that to say i thought this was going to be one of those but it finally actually happened um a year ago and they were so great and just knew what they liked and knew what they wanted, but also were super open to ideas. And we tracked it here in six hours, totally wow. live, vocals in there, live. That's fantastic. And so it was, you know, it had that, it had that energy, you know, where it was like, because it's so much work leading up to it. You're writing all of this music and all of these parts and, you know, you show up to the day with a stack of paper like this you know and you've called 35 people and they're all coming in <laughs> and they require compensation at the end and like and she flies she's from atlanta so her and her producer came here and so there's just you know a lot of build up mm -hmm. and um but it went fantastic and it sounds really i think the record is really cool it's like an ep though it's like six tunes um so yeah, that's like the best version of it. Like that's how good it can be, you know, and just, and the music was fun and the players had a good time. You know, a lot, a lot of what I'm thinking about once I know that the artist is cool and taken care of and they feel good is like the next people is like the musicians I bring in. Like I want them to, when you put the music in front of them, they should look at it and go, Yes, like that should look like music that they see and mm -hmm. they like the way it looks and it's fun to play and um, it's not confusing and it's not hard. Like you can write things that are hard, but it's more like you need to show them that you understand how their instrument works and then mm -hmm. you respect them and and then they play the parts and you make changes if you need, but you, you know, little subtle changes and, and everyone feels good and they get paid and they leave and like that's <laughs> i mean that's that's the fun part to me that's the that's kind of the magical stuff where it's like that relationship with the music the musicians in the room when we're doing it um and then the sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship with the artist that's like getting at the heart of like what the music is do you think there's an emphasized importance on like community when you're working with musicians being a conductor yeah yeah, I mean, basically, you can't do it without it. There is no, I mean, some, a few places in the world you could do it where you're just literally hiring. I mean, in LA, you could just hire the best people. If you have lots of money, you know, mm -hmm. you can do it, and it doesn't matter. But, but it's like this, where it's like, you have to kind of build, and over the last 10 years, I've built up, you know, a community of people that trust me that i'm not going to number one waste their time mm -hmm. um and that i'm going to as as crass as it sounds that i'm going to pay them as best as i can like literally i'm going to pay them the most i can pay them mm -hmm. and that when they show up uh, it'll be fun and the music will be good and it'll be fun to play and then they go home and they never have to think about it again and it's like that doesn't just happen like you can't right, just right. hope that people care and hope that you have to they have to know me and trust me that like okay i call them for a gig and they say 
okay, yeah, I know that's going to be good. I know that's going to be cool. I'm not going to have to deal with bullshit because a lot of, a lot, I mean, frankly, a lot of the music world and studio world can be like that. It's like show up and you're waiting around forever for the person to show up and set up their stuff and, you know, it's fine for a certain thing for like, mm -hmm. if you're the drummer that like is like the baddest cat in the world, you can show up and just take your time and um and the producer everyone they've got a studio or you're recording in someone's garage you know and so <laughs> yeah. like even like big artists you know they're recording at home like they don't care they they spent eight months making their record and it's fine but when it comes to arrangements specifically when you're dealing with strings and orchestra musicians like it can't be like that and it can still be fun it can be vibey and it can be super friendly and and not uptight that's kind of the other side it's like you have to find the people that aren't like that because that's a whole world of, you know, string players and orchestral wind players that are just not fun to be around. Mm -hmm. Not because they're bad people, but just because they're used to just showing up at the orchestra. You know, they show up at the rehearsal and they show up at the concert and that's it. That's all they want to do. Uh, they're not really interested in this world. Mm -hmm. So finding people that do like coming to the studio and do like playing on indie rock music, <laughs> frankly. Um, but... You know what I mean? So it's like it's a weird like Venn diagram of people <laughs> yeah. that you have to find and that and that you have to get them to trust you. And it, you know, at first, early days of space bomb, it was hard, and we made some mistakes. I made some mistakes in like meaning like just like you know, just not dealing with the business side in the right way, or t or wasting people's time, or like not planning things well. It's like for me, it's like it has to be planned like down to the minute like the Faye Webster record we did in six hours yeah five five or six hours and it's like that's not it didn't just happen like it was like months of work to make sure that we could do it in that amount of time and like timing it down to the minute like I'm a crazy person for that kind of organizational <laughs> stuff but for her it was magical for her she just showed up she sat in that room and she sang the songs but really it was like equations of like time <laughs> like figuring out how long we had to spend on this and like how much i the budget they had like how much time can we spend which means how many players can i have which means how good is it going to sound for the and how i need to orchestrate for this number of players because we only have this much money and this much time you know what i'm saying yeah it's a huge kind of problem to, to solve and then hopefully for the artist, they just show up and they go, oh my God, like, <laughs> I have strings on my record or whatever it is, you know. How luxurious. I mean, it is. And it, it literally is luxurious. And, you know, and they're often spending more money than they ha usually do. And so it should feel luxurious. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like literally, it's a luxury. <laughs> and um, so it should feel that way, you know. And um, so when it's really good, man, it's... it's um, even though it's a ton of work, but I'm, I like it. I'm good at it. And it's, um, but in the moment, in the day, it's nothing like it. You know? <laughs> it's better than a gig for me. Like it's better than playing a huge festival for like 5,000 people. I like that. That's fine. But like, that's not for me being in the studio with like 30 people and an artist that's like starry eyed. That's the vibe. That's the impactful moment. That's for me. Yeah. That's kind of, and so, and that's probably why I'm better at that than I am at being a touring musician because I like it more. And so, and that's why people ask me to do that more than they ask me to go on tour. It's, you know, it's not, you're better at it. it's not a coincidence. Sense. Yeah. It's yeah. Not a yeah. Coincidence, so. I, it seems like you really have your own priorities and preferences kind of straight in your mind. Yeah. Well, you start, you, over time, you just kind of learn about yourself and you learn the things you're good at and you and you see over and over oh that worked and that didn't work so let me stop doing the thing that doesn't work yeah and I'll yeah do this thing because that worked and in all kinds of areas of, yeah, of yeah. your professional career um very specific and small to like big big things like i won't tell you more <laughs> not that i'm not good at that but you know what i mean it just I yeah, just, yeah. For all kinds of reasons i just well, let me just do this that does make sense. Have you had a lot of challenges in dividing, figuring out what works, or does it just oh, feel yes. natural? No, it's challenging. Really? In, yeah, make up mistakes all the time. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's like you say yes to something that you shouldn't have said yes to. That's essentially yeah. what, how they rear their head is that. 
and then you're out on the road and you're like shit i shouldn't have said yes to this or is it kind of just that it hits you a moment of this was a bad idea if it hits you but then you realize you knew it all along you realize yeah i knew yeah. it I knew I should have said <laughs> none of this or i should have done this instead of this or um, and again, it can be small little things. It can be literally like moments in the recording where I was like, oh, I knew I shouldn't have written that. That was a mistake. Now I have to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And now I have to remember that. Or it can be, like I say, big, big career decisions. Like I should have not put out that record. <laughs> or I should have not spent, you know, six months writing that thing. But, um, but yeah, but that's how they, that's how they kind of show themselves. And it is just learning. You're learning. Or, it never i wouldn't say it's natural and for me anyway like i don't always know the right thing to do an experiential thing yeah you just have to do it and you go ah yep okay that's how you know and then next time hopefully you, you remember <laughs> <laughs> and you and you make the right decision next time so, with any luck yeah so and then that hopefully that will steer you and like i say when you go where the energy is that's kind of another way to say that which is like you're just kind of this you know the swath of things that you might be good at or you could do and like you just kind of follow the energy to like oh everything is telling me i should be doing this instead of this okay so it, it feels like this entire process is very natural it just kind of comes as a part of the trade maybe yeah, i think successful people in the music industry learn that that pivoting is a part of it and that at any moment you have to Excuse me. You have to sort of, yeah, pivot in small and big ways. Because especially like once you get older, like you have to pay the bills. No kidding. And you know, if you want to still do it, if you want to still be a musician, you know, there's all kinds of people that just you know go do something else, and that's also good and fine. You know, it's like I don't like the the the, the input is not equaling the output. You know. Even though it's something you love, you know. So, I feel very um, fortunate to be able to do music for every, you know, this is what mm -hmm. I do, music. And um, it may not always be that way, but, <laughs> you know, I'm hung, I'm hung in there this far. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, I don't know how natural it is for other people. I don't know if other people always know the right thing to do, but I, I tend to see kind of, what i'm saying which is more just like you know you're trying different things and like the things that work you you go with and the things that don't work you you don't you try not to do again okay yeah that does make sense what has been your biggest trouble in this windy path of yours if you've had like one particular <sighs> this was my big learning uh, moment i mean there's been so many really i mean i think you know when i when i first got out of school and i think a lot of people fall into this which is they go okay what do I do now? And then you think, okay, well, what do people do to make money? There's, the, I think that there's this, there's an idea that there's a job to get. Mm -hmm. And and I always tell us, people always, you know, you have a studio, you have whatever, an email address, people email you and they say like, oh, I just got out of college. And they always say, this is why I didn't like that word. They always say, I have an overwhelming passion for music. I swear to God, I've read that <laughs> phrase a hundred times. Overwhelming passion for music. <laughs> They're overwhelmed by their passion. And I feel it. I feel that they have passion. But they think that there's some job that, that they're going to get. There is no job. And that's why I tell them, there is no job. Mm -hmm. You have to create the job. There is no job. Hmm. And so... Um, I think early on, I thought that maybe there was a job, you know? And so, like I said, when I got out of school, I thought, well, what do people do to make money? And so that's kind of when I went down the road of writing music for TV and commercials and stuff. And I wouldn't say that I wasn't successful. I mean, I didn't, you know, I'm not retired in the South of Spain or anything, but I, like, I lived off of it for a time. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't... You kind of realize like okay well sure i could probably grind this out and and i could probably make a living at this for my life but like i actually don't really love this so like it's really hard every little corner of the music industry and i assume every other industry but i don't know about this yeah, right so every other every little corner of the music industry is hard to get into it's not easy mm -hmm. it's like it's a little gate 
and there's gatekeepers around all the edges <laughs> and they do not want to let you in yeah and so it's hard so like getting into commercial mu writing music commercials writing music for trailers writing music for tv and even though i had some success like i would never i wasn't like breaking in so mm -hmm. it's like man do i want to spend all my energy trying to break into this thing and then uh -huh. i feel like so well, what what would i like to spend my energy on and so then um at, that's kind of when space bomb started coming around you know and then so then okay well let me try this let's see if this feels better and it felt better and it was also more successful mm -hmm. because it felt better i think you know and it, we were better at it um but I think my original idea for like writing music for like it's like writing music for a movie. It's like, oh yeah, people make lots of money writing music for movies. That's a job I want to get. But you don't get that job. That's not a job you get. You only get that if you're if you know the director. You know the director because you've been doing it. So the people that have been doing it for ages, they do it because they love it. They've been writing music for short films since they were seventeen. Mm-hmm. So you're not gonna you're not gonna get that kind of job. <laughs> you're just not going to. Yeah, yeah. And so unless you really love it and you would do it no matter what, you have a passion for it, you would do it whether you were poor or you were rich, you know, if that's not you, then you shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I guess I, sh I, I I if I had a mistake to say I would I, that that kind of thinking early on I think slowed me down. Mm -hmm. from from pivoting at the right time i think i spent too much time doing that and uh, maybe other little things you know where i was just like God, spinning my wheels you know thinking that i was going to get somewhere and someone was going to go you're really great let me hire you for this job you know hmm. even things that seem like they were jobs to get like like when i'm touring for foxygen which is a band i did not know i don't know none they're from california i don't know them mm -hmm. i know natalie i know matt i know some of the other people i tour with i don't know those guys I mean, I know them because now I know them. Right, right. At the time. And it's like, it seems like being an MD, being the music director for a tour, is a job. And it is a job. But it isn't a job you get. They don't, like, advertise for that job. It was like, they were going on tour. We had just made a record. And they were like, oh, shit, how are we going to do a tour on this record? We just made this crazy orchestral record. I'm like, well, let's ask Trey what he would do. Oh, I would just, I would write three horn charts. And put a band together. We do keyboards, guitars, three horns, and blah blah blah. Okay, will you do that for us? Sure. Okay. So then I put a band together, write the charts, we go on tour. So it seems like a job that I got, but I didn't. I created the job. Sure. And everything in my experience in the music industry is that 100 percent of it. Really, that's there fascinating. Is, there is no job. <laughs> so that's the mistake. I think that kind of thinking, and I get emails all. I mean, every other day from people thinking there's a job. You know, they want to they, they want to come here. They want to intern here, and I stopped. You know, back in the day, I used to get interns. You know, for for this studio, and I had previous studios. Like, but I realized it's like it's like slowing that process for them. It's hmm. Like, you think you're gonna get an internship, and then you're gonna get a job. You're not going to. I just, it's it's a bummer, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. So, I think that slowed me down a bit, but at this point, it's okay. You know, it's all it's all a learning process, so you have to find it in your own way. Um, but I just see a lot of people have that mentality, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't think about it till they get out of school. <laughs> they think about it before they went into school. Like, what am I going to do when I get out? So, be thinking about that for yourself. <laughs> oh, for sure. You just told it to an entire class full yeah. of college. Students, yeah, there so. you go. So, it's too late. <laughs> it seems that that. That conversation lasted a little bit, um, if you don't mind. No, no, that was amazing for lots of reasons. Um, I might jump kind of towards the end. Sure, yeah. Though you sort of answered it. Is that the kind, as opposed to the overarching advice you'd give, like, specific people who want to perform or make something music, mm -hmm. people who have that kind of drive mm -hmm. do you have any advice for like budding composers or arrangers mm -hmm. who already they're not looking for the job they're mm -hmm. just they're just trying to learn how to do it because they want to know how to do it yeah i mean i think if you're trying to develop a craft uh, in anything and in, in the arts but in music i think you just 
you have to already be you have to be doing the thing that you want to do yeah right so like the reason i got asked on the very first matt white record to write strings is because i was just messing around with it like on my own yeah i yeah. knew that i was and so i was exploring that purely for my own knowledge and mm -hmm. just because i liked it yeah right because it sounded and um so yeah things that you are interested in do don't wait for someone to ask you to do it you just have to do it so you have to create energy so in the same way i said you need to follow where the energy is in mm -hmm. your in your sphere like where is their energy you also have to create energy around the thing that you want to do so for example in after college i did this thing where uh, and with Matt, Matt was also interested in this kind of stuff. And we he, we put this thing, uh, he had this thing called Patchwork Collective, which was like this, it was like a concert series. And actually Dean was a part of it, you know, their spacebound guy that you just met. Walking yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and some other guys were kind of loosely affiliated. And it was like, um, they basically put on concerts in Richmond where they would have like a classical ensemble and then like a jazz thing and then like a punk band. And it would be like the same. That would be like one show. Mm -hmm. All these shows all over town. And so one show that we did, I can't remember what the other artists were, but there was like an orchestra, like put it together, just like literally like slapdash, like who wants to be in this orchestra? Wow, nice. I don't remember how many people we had, but it was 30-ish or 20 or something. I don't know. Very nice. It was fun. And it was, I mean, I we played in Gallery 5. And wow. it was just like, I don't even remember what else was going on. It was weird <laughs> and crazy. And so anyway, but so that was a thing. It was like just for the love of doing it. And I wrote a piece and we played it. And it was like, and then Matt was like, oh yeah, that was cool. And he had written something or he was, he was just putting it on. Anyway, so I guess my point being, create your own energy around the things that you like and the things that you want to be doing. Never ever wait for anyone to ask you to do the thing that you want to do because they're not going to unless you're already doing it. You have to already be doing it. I say the same thing for people that you know they're like singer songwriter and it's like, oh, I want a record label. It's like you can't have a record label until you don't need one, you can't have one until literally you're already doing it, you're already successful. I mean, maybe in the 90s and the 80s, like there was a time where that happened, sure, yeah, people would just get plucked out of the suburbs and they were signing <laughs> the deals that doesn't happen anymore you have to already be doing it touring you can fill you know a 300 cap room up the east coast you know for for two weeks and you have to have this number of spotify streams or whatever i don't know the metrics of it but you have to already be doing it for a label to care and for a manager to get a manager you don't need a manager it's like i mean it's a, it's kind of a screwy reality but so just don't wait for people to ask you to do the thing and don't like expect someone to give you the opportunity if you aren't already doing it. They're going to go, well, show me, like you say you can do this thing, but like if you could do it, why aren't you doing it? You know, if you're a good enough artist that people like you, why don't people like you? You know, why can't you fill the room down the street? You can't fill the camel, then why, why would I care? I don't care how good your song is. I don't care how good of a singer you are or an arranger you are or whatever you are, you know? And it's like, yeah, I'll get email, you know, about like engineers. Like, oh, I, I'm an engineer. I record music. I want to record at your studio. It's like, well, I haven't heard of you. you know, I mean, I don't know. You know what I mean? You would already be here if you were recording. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the advice. Just <laughs> do the thing that you want to do create the energy around the thing you want to do and then eventually hopefully someone will find if you're good at it then you'll find people that are also interested in that and you guys can go together i guess i don't know that's kind of what i did so we kind of all kind of came up together i think that's pretty normal though I, I, yeah that sounds about right but, but you talked about community before but i think that's a big part of at least when you're in a place that's not la i think or, yeah, I don't know how people succeed in like growing up in LA or Nashville or those kind of places. But in a place that's not that, yeah, you kind of have a little community of people and you kind of all build each other up and create 
you can, you can create energy around your own stuff together much easier than one person by themselves. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, creating your own energy, that, that yeah. resonates a lot. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very good advice. I'm glad it's being caught on camera. <laughs> yeah, right. Do you have anything else you want to say? I don't think so. I mean, you <laughs> need to give me some context. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I can probably ramble on about all kinds of things. Right? <laughs> oh, um, don't worry. Many people are good at that. Yeah, yeah. But I think that just about does it for me. Great. Thank man. you, Trey. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. We'll stop the video now. <laughs>